Steam is the working fluid for an ideal Rankine cycle. Saturated vapor enters the turbine at 8 MPa and saturated liquid exits the condenser at 0.0075 MPa. The net power output of the cycle is 100 MW. Determine the thermal efficiency, the backwork ratio, the mass flow rate of steam in kilograms per hour, the rate of heat addition, the rate of heat rejection, and then if the condenser was cooled by a stream of cooling water entering the condenser at 15 degrees Celsius, determine the minimum stream mass flow rate in kilograms per hour which would prevent the cooling water from exceeding 35 degrees Celsius. I will begin with a system diagram. Next, I will begin to parse out the properties that I know about my four state points. Remember that it takes two independent intensive properties to fully define a state point, so my goal is going to be to try to identify two independent intensive properties for all four state points. Having those would mean that I could look up whatever it was that I needed. First, let me pose the question, how many pressures do we have? There are two. Because remember, like the Brayton cycle, all heat addition and rejection processes in the Rankine cycle are assumed to be isobaric. So the condenser occurs isobarically, and the boiler occurs isobarically. Therefore, P2 is equal to P3, which is the high pressure, and P4 is equal to P1, which is the low pressure. So I will identify those pressures over here. P high is 8 megapascals. P low is 0 0.0075 megapascals. And then state 1 and 4 are at the low pressure. And 2 and 3 are at the high pressure. Next, I recognize that I was told saturated vapor enters the turbine, and that would be state 3, and I will show that in my properties as a quality. X3 is equal to 1 because it's a saturated vapor, and a saturated liquid exits the condenser, that would be state 1, so I will write that as X1 is equal to 0. States 1 and 3 are now fully defined, from which I can look up whatever I want. What I will want to look up is eventually going to be enthalpy for my energy balances. But in the meantime, I will also want S1. Why? Because our compression and expansion processes are assumed to be isentropic unless we're given enough information to deduce otherwise. We have not been given that information, therefore we assume S2 is equal to S1 and S4 is equal to S3. So at state 1, I want to look up H1 and S1. With that S1, I can look up H2. At state 3, I will want to look up H3 and S3. And at state 4, I will use that S3 to look up H4. And with that, I have enough information to get started on my property lookups. I want the four enthalpies, and I need S1 and S3 to be able to get there. I also am going to add specific volume 1 into the mix for reasons that will make sense later. For now, let's just add it to the lookups that I'm requiring us to do. Our working fluid is water, which means that our tables for these properties are going to be tables A2 through A5. And remember, the first part of the lookup process is going to be to fix the phase at all four state points. Once I know the phase, I can go into the correct table and evaluate the properties that I need. If you want a review of the property lookup process, I have some videos under Thermo 1's Chapter 3 videos that I think might be helpful. But for now, let's start with state 1, assuming that you guys totally remember how to do all of these property lookups. So at state 1, I have a pressure of. 0 0.075 bar and a quality of zero, meaning I'm going to grab the saturated liquid property from my saturation tables by pressure. 
Remember that the saturation tables A2 and A3 contain the same information. One is just listed in even increments of pressure. One is listed in even increments of temperature. So if I jump into table A3 and find 0.075, I see that I don't happen to have a row corresponding to 0.075 bar, which means I'm going to have to interpolate between 0.06 and 0.08. I will write that out as 0.075 minus 0.06 divided by 0.08 minus 0.06 that will represent the proportion of the way I am between 0.06 and 0.08, and I will apply that same proportion to specific volume, specific enthalpy, and specific entropy. Those are the VF, HF, and SF values at 0.075 bar. And to make this a little bit easier to follow, as I'm scrolling all over the place, I will highlight these two rows so that we can just grab the values as we see fit. And when I'm typing this on my calculator, I will type it using the solve function so that hopefully it's a little bit easier for you guys to reverse engineer what I'm doing. When you calculate it yourself, of course, you would probably do the algebra and actually compute a number as opposed to trying to leave the calculator to do the algebra. Anyway, 0.075 minus 0.06 divided by 0.08 minus 0.06 is equal to, let's go with VF first because it's right here. The thing that I'm looking for which I'm going to call x for now, minus the value at 0.06 bar, which would be 0.0010064. Remember that that column is not VF. It is VF times 10 to the third. Therefore, to get back to VF, you have to take this quantity times 10 to the negative third. Anyway, then I'm dividing by 0.0010084 minus 0.0010064, and I get a value for my V1 of 0.001008. So 0 0.001008 cubic meters per kilogram. One look up down. Do you want to go? At stay one. I apply the same proportion to my HF values. So I will jump back into the calculator. I will grab that same calculation and just replace the terms on the right. This would be x minus 151.53 divided by 173.88 minus 151.53 and I get an h1 value of 168.293 that would be kilojoules per kilogram and then my s1 value is going to be between 0 0.5210 and 0 0.5926 so calculator we swap out those two values. I'm going to be taking x minus 0 0.5210 divided by 0 0.5926 minus 0 0.5210. And I get an S1 value of 0 0.5747. 0 0.5747 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, stay one done. For state 2, I have a pressure of 8 megapascals, which is 80 bar, and an entropy of 0 0.5747. So the first step is going to be to determine the phase at state 2. Easiest way to do that would be to look up SF and SG at P2 and compare my entropy to those values. So at 80 bar, I'm going to be looking at an SF and SG value of... 3.2068 and 5.7432 because this first column is SF, this second column is SG. So at 80 bar, that's 3.2068 and 5.7432. And the logic goes, if my entropy is less than SF, I must have a compressed liquid. If it's greater than SG, I must have a superheated vapor. And if it's between SF and SG, then I must have a saturated liquid vapor mixture. So my value of 0 0.5747 is going to be less than SF, therefore I have a compressed liquid. So now I will jump over to my compressed liquid table, which is table A5, and I find the pressure subtable corresponding to 80 bar, and I see that alas, I don't happen to have a pressure subtable corresponding to 80 bar, which means that I'm going to have to interpolate between 75 bar and 100 bar. Furthermore, I recognize that my value of 0 0.5747 does not appear 
on either one of these nice even rows, which means I'm going to have to interpolate between two rows and two subtables, which means that I have a triple interpolation on my hands. And remember from Thermal 1, there are two ways that we can go about doing that. Either interpolating between the rows first and then interpolating on the between the two subtables, between the columns essentially, or interpolate between the columns first to generate a little subtable corresponding to 80 bar, and then interpolate between the rows. You can do whichever method you prefer, they both yield the same answer, but performing the interpolation by hand is a little bit easier to follow if I start by interpolating between the two pressure subtables on the same row to essentially build a little subtable of our own. That way you can more easily follow what I'm doing. So I'm going to jump back to the iPad. I'm going to bring us our own little subtable corresponding to 80 bar. And I have a temperature column, an enthalpy column, and an entropy column. And my entropy is going to be between 0 0.5696 and 0 0.5686 and 1.0704 and 1.0688, which means that I'm going to be between the temperatures of 40 and 80. So 40, 80. And I'm going to interpolate for an H value at 80 bar and 40 degrees Celsius. And then I'm going to interpolate for an H value at 80 bar and 80 degrees Celsius. This would be call this uh, 1, 2, and then an entropy value at 40 degrees Celsius here and 80 bar, and then an entropy value at 80 degrees Celsius and 80 bar, which is here, and then I'm going to use my entropy, which is 0 0.5747. To interpolate for a value of enthalpy at that entropy. Does that all make sense? I mean, I could grab T2 while I'm here, but I don't actually need it, and it's kind of a waste of time to calculate yet another thing at this state point. So I will just leave it off for now. So we have four interpolations to do to establish the framework that we are actually using for our actual interpolation. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So jumping back to our tables, I'm grabbing the value of enthalpy at 80 bar and 40 degrees Celsius first. So that interpolation is going to be wake up calculator. Solving between pressures would be 80 minus 75 divided by 100 minus 75, and that's equal to, and look, I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of interpolations here. So I'm going to make this a little bit easier on myself by plugging in variables. I can do that on my TA-89. You have an 89 or a 92 or an NSPIRE or equivalent, you can do the same thing. Uh, if you're working through this on a simpler calculator, you're probably going to have to just punch the numbers every time. And that's of course fine, but this will make it a little bit faster for us to work this on the example problem. So I'm going to say X minus A divided by B minus A. And then I'm going to evaluate for X. And I'm going to plug in an A value of, so we are interpolating for enthalpy first and 40 degrees Celsius, so 174.18, and a B value of, that's, that's letter A again in calculator, and a B value of 176.38. So our first value here is 174.62. Okay, and then our second value is going to be enthalpy at 80 degrees Celsius. So A is 340.84, and B is 342.83, 341.238, and then an entropy value at 40. So I'm using an A value of 0 0.5696 and a B value of 0 0.5686, giving me an entropy of 0 0.5694. And I'm so confident that we're doing this correctly that I'm going to grab the other one as well so that I can just write them both down at the same time. That'd be 1.0704 and 
1.0688. So those are our two entropy values forming the framework for our final interpolation here. So that was 0 0.5694 and 1.07. 008. And that seems very high, so I'm just going to go double check. 1.07008. Yep, okay. Now we have everything we need to actually perform our actual interpolation. So I'm going to say solve 0 0.5747 minus 0 0.5694 divided by 1.07008 minus 0 0.5694 is equal to what we're looking for, x minus 174.62 divided by 341.238 minus 174.62. Calculator, if you would please solve for x, we get 176.384. And I'm gonna write that up here. 176.384. And while we're here, I mean, just for fun, we can interpolate for temperature as well. I mean, why not, right? We did all this work already. Why not do a little bit of extraneous work? Look, it's 40.42 degrees Celsius at state two. Hooray! Anyway, that process of going from state one to state two is a lot of interpolation. And it could have been worse. I mean, imagine for a moment if we had ended up between two different rows in the two different tables. And imagine if my state point was below the lowest pressure subtable, then my interpolation would be between the lowest pressure subtable and the saturated liquid property. There is a shortcut that we can take to come up with our enthalpy value at state two, and that shortcut is actually um, a navigation through fluid mechanics in order to get to a property. And that's by considering the work of a pump if we have incompressible flow. So if we were to take our conservation of energy, Reynolds transport theorem, control volume equation, and simplify it for a situation where we had incompressible flow, undergoing steady state operation, and we were to neglect friction, we would end up with the work of a pump on a specific basis is approximately equal to specific volume times pressure change. And our specific work of our pump here is H2 minus H1. So if we make the assumption that the flow from 1 to 2 is pretty close to incompressible, we can just take the specific volume at either state point, because it's assumed to be the same, because we're assuming that the density doesn't change, times P2 minus P1, that gives us our difference in enthalpy. So I could say H2 is pretty close to H1 plus specific volume times P2 minus P1. We had H1 already. It was 168.293. And we are adding to that our specific volume of state one, which is 0 0.001008 cubic meters per kilogram multiplied by a pressure difference. Why don't we write that pressure difference in bar? That would be 80 minus 0 0.075 bar. And then I recognize that a bar is 100 kilopascals. And actually, let me back up a second. I want to get to kilojoules. So best practice is to start at kilojoules and work backwards. A kilojoule can be written as a kilonewton times a meter. And a kilopascal can be written as a kilonewton per square meter. Forgive me, I'm running out of space here. And everyone knows it's impossible to move when you're working digitally. Kilopascals cancels kilopascals, bars cancel bars, kilonewtons cancels kilonewtons, cubic meters cancels square meters and meters, and kilograms are left over. So if I were to take 0 0.001008 times the quantity 80 minus 0 0.075 times 100, I would yield a quantity in kilojoules per kilogram, which I could add to 168.293 to get an approximate value for H2. So let's try that out. Calculator, if you would please wake up. That's 168.293 plus 0 0.001008 times the quantity 80 minus 0 0.075 times 100. We get 
So compare and contrast here. With five interpolations, we came up with a value that was 176.384. With zero interpolations and a single calculation, we came up with a value that is 176.349. How much error is there in that calculation? Well, let's find out. 176.349. Actually, let me just grab the value so that we can keep the trailing decimals. Minus 176.384 divided by 176.384. That's what? 0.02%. That's probably an acceptable amount of error. So here are my rules for that shortcut. If you have a pump, not a compressor, but a pump, and you're in the compressed liquid region and the saturated liquid line the whole time, you can use this shortcut. Just be sure to note in your assumptions that you're assuming incompressible flow from one to two. Anyway, we have the better value, so let's keep the better value and move on to state three, which is thankfully going to be just a matter of finding 80 bar in our saturation tables. So back to table eight, three. We are looking for 80 bar, which is down here. I will grab the highlighter tool again. And what I want at state three is an HG value, this column here, and an SG value, this column here. And I can't quite fit both of those on the same sheet of paper at any reasonable scale, so I apologize for these small numbers on your screen. But if I write down 5.7432 for my entropy, 5.7432, 5.7432, and an enthalpy value of 2758 on the nose. That gives me my lookups. And for my lookup at state four, I have generally the same process as state two. That is, I need to use my entropy at state four, which is the same as state three, and compare that to SF and SG at my pressure at state four, and then use our value to determine the phase. So I'm going to have an entropy of 5.7432, and if we scroll on back up to 0 0.075 bar, and try to find the hand tool in Adobe again, I can scooch over and zoom in. I see that my entropy value is going to be between SF and SG. I mean, my SF value is going to be whatever the interpolation for three quarters of the way between 0 0.5210 and 0 0.5926 is. I mean, I guess we actually have that number. It's like 0 0.57, whatever it was. And three quarters of the way between 8.33 and 8.23 is going to be what? Like 8.25, 8.26. I have an entropy value of 5.74, which is definitely between SF and SG. Therefore, I have a saturated liquid vapor mixture. So my interpolation for enthalpy at state four is going to come from interpolating between SF and SG at 0 0.075 bar. And I need to apply that same proportion to the difference between HF and HG at 0 0.075 bar. So lucky me, I have more interpolation steps to do. Let's see if we can draw that out here on the iPad again. So I am going to take at state four, x4, which is equal to h4 minus hf at 0 0.075 bar divided by hg minus hf, both at 0 0.075 bar. That's equal to s4 minus sf at 0 0.075 bar divided by sg minus sf at 0 0.075 bar. And thankfully, hf and sf are already done because we did that for state one because we had 0 0.075 bar and a saturated liquid. So all we really need to do to support this interpolation is going to be to figure out SG and HG. So for SG at 0 0.075 bar, I am going to take 0 0.075 minus 0 0.06 divided by 0 0.08 minus 0 0.06 and set that equal to the value that I'm looking for, x minus 8.3304 divided by 8.2287 minus 8.3304. And I get 8.25413. 8.25413 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And for Hg, that's going to be the same proportion. 
except using the values at hg. That'd be x minus 2567.4 divided by 2577.0 minus 2567.4, and I get 2574.6. 2574.6. And I should have mentioned this earlier, but I'll mention it now. When you are interpolating between values that are going the opposite direction as the value that you're using to drive the interpolation, like in this case, pressure is increasing from 0 0.06 to 0 0.08, and enthalpy is increasing from 0 0.06 and to 0 0.08 bar, but the entropy is going down, it can be easy to accidentally switch the direction of your entropy interpolation. You might have been tempted to write 0 0.075 minus 0 0.06 divided by 0 0.08 minus 0 0.06 is equal to x minus 8.2287 minus divided by 8.3304 minus 8.2287 because your brain wants you to write a positive quantity, but it doesn't actually work because you aren't grabbing the value at 0 0.06 and 0 0.08 anymore. You're switching them. It's okay to have a negative difference because you have a negative number in both the numerator and denominator on the right-hand side of that interpolation, and that's fine. Just make sure you keep an eye out for it. It's good to get into the habit of checking that the proportion of the way you are between the numbers actually makes sense. So we got 8.25. I can see that 8.25 is closer to 8.2287 than it is to 8.3304, which should be expected because 0.075 is much closer to 0 0.08 than it is to 0 0.06. So just get into the habit of double checking the sanity of your interpolation to make sure that you didn't actually switch the direction and come up with a quarter of the way across as opposed to three quarters of the way across, if that makes sense. Anyway, I have everything I need to be able to solve for H4. Now, we could also solve for X4. I mean, we don't need it, but we already determined T2. I mean, we could calculate it now, one thing at a time. So S4 was 5.7432 minus SF at 0 0.075, which was 0 0.5747, divided by SG, which is 8.25413 minus SF, which is 0 0.5747 is equal to the thing that I'm looking for minus HF, which was 168.293 divided by HG, which is 2574.6 minus 168.293. And I get an X value of 1787.81. And does that make sense? We are closer with 5.7432 to eight than we are to 0 0.5. Therefore, our enthalpy should be closer to 2,500 than it is to 200, and it is, which makes sense. So my H4 value is 1787.81. And with that enthalpy, I have everything that I actually need to determine my work in, my work out my Q in and my Q out, which will get me thermal efficiency, the back work ratio. I can use the power along with my network out to determine the mass flow rate of steam. I can multiply that mass flow rate of steam by specific Q in and specific Q out to determine parts D and E. And then for part E, I'm going to be relating Q dot out to M dot cooling water times the difference in enthalpy of the cooling water itself. So I have everything that I need lookup wise. Just for funsies here, let's calculate a quality at state four, just in case I decide to plot the TS diagram, I have something to refer to. So that is just going to be 5.7432 minus 0 0.5747 divided by 8.25413 minus 0 0.5747. And look, we get about 0 0.673 coolings. So next, even though it isn't explicitly asked for directly, Let's calculate the work in, the Q in, the work out, and the Q out. I have an open system analysis for each of these devices, and I recognize that I only have work in occurring in the pump, so I'm just going to end up with H2 minus H1. And again, that comes from an energy balance on the pump. It's isentropic, which implies adiabatic. 
We're neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energy, and we're assuming work is only in the inward direction. Therefore, it simplifies down to H2 minus H1. Energy balances on the boiler, turbine, and condenser, respectively, would yield Q in work out and Q out terms because only one thing is happening at a time. So for Q in, I would end up with H3 minus H2. Then work out would be H3 minus H4. And Q out would equal H4 minus H1. So my enthalpy values will yield these four quantities. And I will bring the calculator back up. And just for the sake of not scrolling all over the place, I'm going to calculate all four of them before I start writing them down. So 176.384 minus 168.293 is work in, which is 8.091. And then H3 minus H2 yields Q in, so 2758.0 minus 176.384. And that's 2581.62. And then 3 minus 4 yields work out, which is 2758.0 minus 1787.81. And 4 minus 1 yields Q out, which is 1787.81. Minus 168.293. So my four quantities are 8.091 and then 2581.62 and then 970.19 kilojoules per kilogram and 16. 19.52. Now you know what's coming next, don't you? That's right. I want network out and net heat transfer in. So the network out is going to be the work out minus the work in, which is this number minus this number. We get 962.099. And that should match the net heat transfer in the inward direction. Not sure why I wrote the outward direction. The net heat transfer in would be Q in minus Q out, which would be 2581.62 minus 1619.52. And just to be consistent here, I will actually grab the actual numbers. So we get the trailing decimals that my calculator decides we don't need. Just so I can be a little closer to the actual value that I'm expecting. Hey, look, we got 962.099 again. Calculating both is a good way to check that you built these equations correctly. Right now, we are analyzing the simplest variation of the Rankine cycle that we will possibly consider. Just like with the Brayton cycle, we're going to add stuff to it. And as we start adding stuff to it, our equations are going to become more complicated, which means the probability of messing this up is going to increase. So good practice is to check yourself. Now I can consider what I actually asked for in the problem, which I believe started with thermal efficiency. Thermal efficiency would be the network out divided by the heat transfer in. So I'm going to take our shiny new 962.099 and I'm going to divide by 2581.62 and I get 37.26%. Then I asked for the back work ratio. The back work ratio is the proportion of work out of the turbine that goes back into the work in. And in this case, it should be a very small number because the pump takes almost no work at all. So I'm taking 8.091 and dividing that by 970.19, which yields 8.3%, excuse me, 0.83%, which means all of the rest of the workout is able to go on to network out which is actually the goal of this device. So we have a tremendous proportion of our work of our turbine actually being the profit that we are trying to achieve. A small backwork ratio implies that not much work is being reinvested. We get more proportion as profit, if that makes sense. Then for part C, I wanted the mass flow rate of the steam. 
which is the working fluid in this cycle. And to do that, I'm going to consider the net power output of our cycle and recognize that that quantity can be expressed as mass flow rate times specific network out. Therefore, mass flow rate of our steam is equal to the net power output divided by the net work output. Or more accurately, the specific network output. So I have 100 megawatts, 100 megawatts, and I'm dividing by 962.099 kilojoules per kilogram. And for now, let's calculate a quantity in kilograms per second, and then we can actually get kilograms per hour, which is what the problem asked for. So a megawatt is a thousand kilowatts and a kilowatt is a kilojoule per second. So I'm going to yield kilograms per second as an answer. So 100 times 1000 divided by 962.099 yields a mass flow rate of 103.99 kilograms per second. And then I can get kilograms per hour, which is 3,600 seconds in one hour. So if I multiply that quantity by 3,600, I will yield kilograms per hour, which is 374,182. Kilograms per hour. And then for part D and E, I am going to need a new sheet of paper here. So for part D, I'm looking for Q in, I believe. Yep. And that's Q dot in, which is going to be mass flow rate times specific Q in. The mass flow rate in kilograms per second was 103.939. And if I multiply that by kilojoules per kilogram, I will get an answer in kilowatts. So multiplying by 2,581.62. Something broke. Yields total Q dot in, which is going to be 268332, and that's kilowatts. So two six eight point three three two megawatts. And that's one way to get to that answer. There is another way. Do you spot it? Well, remember that our thermal efficiency represents, among other things, the specific network out over the specific Q in, and also the total net power output divided by the rate of heat input. Therefore, I could have taken the net power output divided by our thermal efficiency and gotten Q dot in. That would have also worked. And that's going to be 100 megawatts divided by 0.37267 and we get 268.332. That would have been the faster way if we hadn't calculated kilograms per second as an intermediate step. Anyway, part E is Q dot out. Again, there are two ways to do this. The first would be M dot steam times specific Q out. Kilograms per second times kilojoules per kilogram will yield kilojoules per second, which is kilowatts. 
So I could take 103.939 and multiply that by, I forget what the Q out number is, 1619.52. And we get 168.332 megawatts. Do you spot the other way? Well, the other way would be recognizing that our heat engine is taking in Q in and outputting Q out plus network out. So an energy balance on the heat engine itself would say Q dot in has to equal the net power output plus Q dot out. Therefore, Q dot out could be written as Q dot in minus whatever went to net power output, which means that we could have taken 268.332 and subtracted 100 and gotten 168.332. That again would have been the faster method, especially if I hadn't calculated and that steam in kilograms per second. Then lastly, part F, we are considering how the cooling process actually occurs in the condenser. So in our system diagram, we just drew a circle and said con condensation is happening here, but we didn't actually elaborate on it. So this is elaborating on it. If I draw that circle again. Let's draw that as a bigger circle. Something like this. Yes, that, that's helpful. How about that? Yeah, that'll work. So this is my condenser, and I have entirely too thick a line weight again. Make some more space. I have my output of my turbine entering at state four, and it is condensing. It leaves at state one. So the logic is we are spraying in our vapor. In this case, it's actually a liquid vapor mixture that is approximately 63% vapor and what, 27% liquid? So some amount of mixture as well. And then we are running that through some coils where cooling water is passed. And let's call this cooling water in and cooling water out. It is gathering on those coils and it is dripping down and leaving as a freshly condensed saturated liquid. So I could draw it something like this. Look, all those droplets, they're falling. They're gathering as a liquid and then leaving. So my question becomes, if we have cooling water passing through this that's entering at 15 degrees Celsius and leaving at 35 degrees Celsius, how much mass flow rate of cooling water do I need? Remember that the amount of heat rejected into this coil is Q dot out. So what I'm saying is the heat rejected by the condenser is going into the cooling water. And I could write that as the mass flow rate of cooling water times the specific heat absorbed by the cooling water, which if I were to set up an energy balance would be m dot cooling water times h cooling water at the outlet minus h cooling water at the inlet. Now I'm in a situation where I am evaluating a delta h for water. Now I could look up the enthalpy of water if I knew two independent intensive properties, but I don't. I only know one. So I could assume a pressure, and then I can look up the enthalpy at that pressure, but it might be better for me to recognize that I have a temperature difference of 20 degrees Celsius, which means I have a relatively small change in temperature, and my liquid is unlikely to evaporate as a result of going up to 35 degrees Celsius, therefore it stays in the same phase the whole time, that is, the cooling water passing through the coils, not the steam on the other side. So if I were to assume the specific heat capacity of the cooling water was constant, and again, let's just remember, I'm assuming the specific heat capacity of the cooling water is constant, 
not the actual working fluid in my cycle, then this would become m dot cooling water times CP of cooling water, which would be CP of H2O, times 35 degrees Celsius minus 15 degrees Celsius. Therefore, m dot cooling water is equal to Q dot out from my cycle divided by CP of water times 20 Kelvin, because the temperature difference in Kelvin is the same as the temperature difference in degrees Celsius. So that's going to be, what was it, 168.332 megawatts. And I'm going to quickly run out of unit conversion space, so I'm going to bring this over here. Let's draw a big old horizontal line. And then we are dividing by the CP of water that is determined halfway between 15 and 35. Halfway between the two would be 25 degrees Celsius. 25 plus 273.15 is going to be about 300 Kelvin. So I'm grabbing the CP of water at 300 Kelvin, which from table A19 in my textbook means I am grabbing. A number that is 4.179, 4.179 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And multiplying by 20 Kelvin. So in order to get the energy inside of the heat transfer rate and kilojoules to cancel, I need to break apart the megawatt. Let's write that as a thousand kilowatts. And a kilowatt can be written as a kilojoule per second. So kilowatts cancels kilowatts, kilo, excuse me, megawatts cancels megawatts, kilojoules cancels kilojoules. And I want hours again. So 3,600 seconds in one hour will leave me with an answer in kilograms of cooling water per hour because we're playing the directly compare the two numbers game. So calculator, I need you to get back on top of business. Let's take 168.332 and multiply by 1000 and then multiply by 3600 and then divide by the quantity 4.179 times 20. And I get 7.25 times 10 to the sixth. So in the interests of direct comparison here, I will write that as 7 million 250,480 kilograms of cooling water per hour and exaggerated commas. So we figured out that the mass flow rate of steam required to operate this was 374,000 kilograms per hour. Does it make sense that we need way more cooling water to accomplish the cooling process? Yeah, it does. Because remember that the working fluid here, the steam, is undergoing a phase change, which means that latent energy is involved. So in order to absorb that massive amount of energy with such a small sensible energy change here means we're going to require way more mass flow rate to do that. So we should expect that the cooling water needs a much, much higher mass flow rate than the working fluid itself. So that does make sense. And by the way, maintaining a certain temperature difference in your cooling water is relatively common. I mean, most steam power plants don't actually just reject heat with some fins and a fan on the side of a condenser. They usually run the working fluid through a heat exchanger pushing it into another fluid, like for example, cooling water, and then dealing with the cooling water separately. In some cases, that might just be uh, dumping the heat into cooling water in the form of a nearby river or stream. In some cases, they're pulling water out of a well and just letting that hot water back into the environment. And if it's too hot, then it's damaging. In other cases, they... Okay, this is the heat engine. Okay, steam power plant. In other cases, they build a big evaporative cooler and then run it through a heat exchanger 
and then spray the cooling water out into the evaporative cooler and then collect the condensed cooling water before pumping it back in. That's a very easy way to get rid of that heat pretty quickly. And then the resulting hot air is pulled upwards, which means that you end up with this little plume of steam and water vapor leaving with the hot air up into the atmosphere. So if you've ever driven by a power plant and you see a big cooling tower that looks like a nuclear silo, it's probably not, unless it's actually a nuclear station. But that cooling tower is cooling the water that they are using to cool the condenser in the actual power cycle. It's just a much more efficient way to handle that. And the advantage of keeping your cooling water separate from your working fluid is you want your working fluid to remain pure. You don't want there to be any sort of air mixed in with it. You don't want there to be impurities. You don't want there to be like a buildup of any sort of minerals inside of your system. Whereas the cooling water you don't care so much about because you don't have to be quite as precious because it's a lot easier to maintain that system. Anyway, that's enough rambling. That's all the required parameters in this problem, but just for fun here, why don't we draw a TS diagram? I think that'd be fun. So I am drawing a TS diagram. And because we are talking about a Rankine cycle, it's going to be helpful if we draw, and because we are talking about a Rankine cycle, it's going to be helpful if we draw saturation lines in order to indicate our state points relative to. So I'm going to draw, go with a thicker line weight. I'm going to draw a saturated liquid line here, and then a saturated vapor line over here. It's not a particularly good drawing. How about that? That's slightly better. Okay, start over. That'll work. And I have two relevant lines of constant pressure here. So I am going to draw those in black. I'm gonna draw low pressure. Remember the line of constant pressure on a TS diagram goes up and to the right. And a high pressure up here. And actually, let's just this whole thing black so that our state points will be red. Poof. So state one is a saturated liquid at the low pressure. So this is 0 0.075 bar, and this is 80 bar. Saturated liquid at the low pressure would appear here. Then state two is on the high pressure line, but that's an isentropic process between one and two, which means we go straight up. State three was a saturated vapor at the high pressure. And state four is an isotropic process straight down the low pressure line. Therefore, my cycle looks like this. And note that if I had pictured my TS diagram when I was defining my state point properties, I could have more quickly determined the phase of states two and four because going up from the saturated liquid line is going to yield a compressed liquid, and going down from the saturated vapor line is going to yield a saturated liquid vapor mixture. And just to be consistent with my thermal one drawings here, I will draw a little arrow here and say this is 60, what was it, 68% of the way over 67.3. Let's be exact, shall we? Okay, then that region enclosed is my network out. And just like when we talked about trying to improve our cycle in the Brayton cycle, I think it's useful to consider what would happen on your TS diagram 
when you're thinking through the implications in terms of thermal efficiency. So remember that the integral under the process from 2 to 3 on a TS diagram would represent the heat transfer in. So if I switch to a blue color here, this region here is my Q in. So the thermal efficiency is going to be the red hatched area divided by the blue hatched area. That's a visual representation of my thermal efficiency. So if I asked you a question like, uh, what if the condenser was operated at 0 0.06 bar instead of 0 0.075 bar? You could immediately determine how that's affecting the thermal efficiency by visualizing what if the bottom line went down. You have the same Q in, but you have a larger network out. Or rather, you have approximately the same Q in because you're scooting a little bit to the left, but that same area is being added to the network out as well. So network out makes a larger proportion of Q in, therefore dropping the condenser pressure would improve thermal efficiency. Or if I were to ask a question like, what if the boiler were taken up to 90 bar instead of 80 bar? How would that affect the thermal efficiency? Well, you're adding the same quantity to both network out and Q in, therefore you're going to be improving the thermal efficiency. Or if we were to superheat the steam in the boiler, Maybe bringing it out to like here. And then we are adding much more area to the network out than proportionally than we are to Q in. Therefore, that's also going to be improving the thermal efficiency. Moving the right line further right also improves thermal efficiency. So generally speaking, increasing our boiler pressure, dropping our condenser pressure, and increasing our maximum temperature are all ways to improve our thermal efficiency. If we set this problem up in MATLAB, we end up with something that looks like this. Here I am using my boiler pressure and condenser pressure as our given information. And we are looking up all of the state point properties using the XSteam toolset, and then determining the work in Q in, work out in Q out, and calculating a thermal efficiency. I'm getting a thermal efficiency of 37.25% with MATLAB, which is good because when we worked it by hand, we got 37.26%. And then MATLAB also has the convenience of being able to plot this on a TS diagram. So here I'm drawing my saturated liquid and saturated vapor lines, drawing a line of constant pressure for 80 bar and 0 0.1 bar, and then plotting our four state points. State point one is appearing here. State point two is actually visually directly on top of it, because in our hand drawing, the lines of constant pressure in the compressed liquid region are a bit exaggerated. In reality, the line of constant pressure follows so closely to the saturated liquid line that you can't really discern the difference between state 1 and state 2 visually on this plot. I mean, consider the fact that T1 is at our saturation temperature at 0 0.075 bar, and T2 was 42 degrees Celsius. I mean, they're very, very close to each other. State 3 is right here, and state 4 is directly below it, which matches what we drew, which makes sense. Working through this in MATLAB allows you the ability to quickly modify given parameters and see the change that it has on your calculation very quickly. I mean, for example, if I were to change the boiler pressure from 80 to 90, I can rerun all the calculations immediately and get a thermal efficiency of 37.65% instead of 37.25%. Or if I were to change this back to 80 and change the condenser pressure to 0 0.065 instead of 0 0.075, I get a thermal efficiency of 37.63%. That brings me to my next comment. If we had considered the isentropic efficiency of our compressor and turbine, I mean, imagine a hypothetical situation where I had given you isentropic efficiencies for this process and asked you to perform all of these calculations with those isentropic efficiencies, all that would be different would be how we got to states 2 and 4. We would have used S1 being equal to S2S to look up an H2S, and then used our definition of the isentropic efficiency for a compressor or a pump to determine H2 actual from H2S. Similarly, we would have used S3 is equal to S4S to look up an H4S, 
So note H2S and H4S would still be 176.384 and 1787.81. And then we would have used our isentropic efficiency of a turbine to represent the difference in enthalpy and use that to calculate H4 actual. So we would have just had an extra step to getting to H2 and H4, and the rest of the analysis would be the same. We would have just used H2 actual and H4 actual instead of these values, which are H2S and H4S. But the advantage of setting up your MATLAB code with an isentropic efficiency, even if it's 100%, is it allows us the ability to change those very quickly. So instead of trying to go back and modify all your code, if you have an isentropic efficiency, instead of not having it, you can just change it here. So if we had an isentropic efficiency of a pump of 0.8 and an isentropic efficiency of our turbine of 0.9, these are very respectable efficiencies, 80% and 90%. Let's see how much that affects our thermal efficiency, shall we? Look at that. It dropped all the way down to 33.8%. Wow. That's quite a big change just by changing our isentropic efficiency just a little bit. And now I think we can consider this example problem done.